Welcome to Hub History, the show that brings you fascinating stories from Boston history. This is Minisode 17, Vikings on the Charles. Hi, I'm Jake. And this week, I'll be taking a little bit of a detour from our Black History Month series. Nikki won't be joining me, unfortunately. We're both out of town right now. But thanks to the magic of podcasting, we're able to bring you this Viking Minisode. But before we talk about Vikings, it's time to take a look at what's coming up this week in Boston history. Monday is February 20th, and that marks the anniversary of the last battle of the War of 1812, and the final battle the USS Constitution ever fought. On February 20th, 1815, the Constitution pursued two British ships near Madeira, a small island off the coast of Morocco. Captain Charles Stewart was in command of the Constitution as she first chased the HMS Levant, catching up and firing on her. Then, as the larger HMS Cyan closed on the Constitution, threatening to trap her between the two British ships, the captain pulled off a dazzling piece of seamanship. You know that scene in Top Gun where Tom Cruise suddenly slams on the brakes so he can get the drop on a pursuing enemy fighter? What are you doing? You're slowing down! You're slowing down! I'm bringing him in closer, Merlin. You're gonna do what? <laughs> Hit the brakes, he'll fly right by. Well, that's basically what Captain Stewart did to the HMS Cyan. He allowed the wind to catch the forward side of the Constitution's main sails, suddenly stopping the ship and swinging it into position to fire on the Cyan. A fierce battle followed, at the end of which Stewart's crew had boarded the Cyan and forced the Levant to strike its colors, taking both ships as American prizes. On February 21, 1947, a Boston inventor named Edwin Land demonstrated the first instant camera. Land was a Harvard dropout who had educated himself on optics and chemistry with the help of a library card. Yes, just like the bar scene in Goodwill Hunting. In 1932, he moved to Cambridge, and he opened a facility to manufacture polarizers under the name Polaroid. On a vacation in 1943, his daughter asked Land why she couldn't see the pictures they had taken right away. He was struck by the idea and brought the Polaroid company's expertise with polymers, dyes, and crystals to bear. At a meeting of the Optical Society on February 21st, 1947, the audience was amazed when Land snapped a photo, waited exactly 60 seconds, then peeled an adhesive backing off the film, revealing a fully developed sepia-toned photo. A year later, the first commercial Polaroid camera would sell out almost immediately when it hit the shelves at Boston's Jordan Marsh department store. We'll link to a profile of Edwin Land and his work on instant photography in the show notes for this week's episode at hubhistory.com slash 017. Wednesday is February 22nd. As tensions grew and occupied Boston in 1770, protests against and harassment of the occupying British soldiers became common. On February 22nd, 1770, a crowd of unruly boys and teens gathered outside the shop of a Tory merchant. They taunted him, and they threw rocks at his shop. An unpopular customs agent named Ebenezer Richardson happened upon the scene and tried to break up the crowd, but he ended up being chased back to his house by the mob. The crowd again taunted Richardson and his wife as they stood outside and argued with the boys. Some trash and rotten food began to fly, and the couple was driven back into their house. Inside, the furious Richardson grabbed a gun. Brandishing it out a window, he first fired an empty barrel at the crowd to try to scare them off. This only served to make the boys mad, and they began hurling rocks and breaking windows. Richardson then fired another round, this time loaded with deadly buckshot. A few balls struck a boy named Sammy Gore, wounding him in the hand and in his thighs. Christopher Sider, the 10-year-old son of German immigrants, was not so lucky. He was hit in the eye and just above the heart. Dr. Joseph Warren operated to try to save him, but he died before the night was done. His funeral a few days later brought thousands of Bostonians out and united them against the occupying British. Just 11 days later, the increasing tensions on both sides would lead to the Boston Massacre. With a hat tip to historian J.L. Bell, we'll have the only known contemporary image of the shooting in this week's show notes. After last week's episode, I'd be remiss not to mention that February 22nd is also the date in 1855 when abolitionists finally purchased the freedom of Anthony Burns. Tune into last week's episode for more of that story. In the months since President Trump was inaugurated, we've seen many protests in this country. 
including the Women's March, which is being called the largest nationwide protest in history. In response, I've seen many posts on social media that characterize all protests as riots. And I've also seen many statements, even from those who should know better, saying that protest, especially violent protest, is not in the American tradition. In response, I submit this February 23rd, 1775 letter from a Boston loyalist. He addresses himself to the Provincial Congress, the revolutionary shadow government that was fomenting rebellion in Massachusetts. Gentlemen, you're assuming the government of Massachusetts Bay makes it unnecessary for me to make any apology for addressing you in this public manner, further than by acquainting you that it is to represent to you the distresses of some of those people who, from a sense of their duty to the king and a reverence for his laws, have behaved quiet and peaceable, and for which reason they have been deprived of their liberty, abused in their persons, and suffered such barbarous cruelties, insults, and indignities, besides the loss of their property by the hands of lawless mobs and riots, as would have been disgraceful even for savages to have committed. The author then lists multiple pages of riots and mob violence directed against loyalists and government officials, before closing the letter with these words. To recount the suffering of all from mobs, rioters, and trespassers would take more time and more paper than can be spared for that purpose. If you'd like to read that long list of protests and riots in the final years before the American Revolution, we'll have a link in the show notes at hubhistory.com 017. Friday is February 24th, and that marks the 1807 anniversary of the town of Brighton. As the name suggests, the area once known as Little Cambridge had previously belonged to the town of Cambridge, before it was set off as an independent town. The original area encompassed about 2,600 acres, and the population of Brighton in the 1810 census was 606 people. The town would remain independent until it was annexed into the city of Boston in 1874. It became known as a major center of the cattle trade, with stockyards and slaughterhouses in every direction. A little slice of the Wild West in our own backyard. On February 25, 1993, Governor Weld released a groundbreaking report on making schools in Massachusetts safe for LGBT youth. The report recommends strategies for protecting the rights of gay kids and reducing an epidemic of suicide. The key recommendations are 1. Protecting LGBT youth from harassment, discrimination, and violence. Number 2. Training teachers and staff in crisis intervention. 3. Creating school-based support groups like Gay Straight Alliances. 4. Providing information for gay youth in school libraries. And 5. Including LGBT issues in school curricula. We'll link to that full report in this week's show notes. And finally, Sunday is February 26th. On February 26, 1776, it was starting to become clear that the Siege of Boston was coming to a close. From his headquarters in Cambridge, George Washington wrote to John Hancock at the Continental Congress in Philadelphia, Sir, we are making every necessary preparation for taking possession of Dorchester Heights as soon as possible, with a view of drawing out the enemy. How far our expectations may be answered, time can only determine. But I should think, if anything will induce them to hazard an engagement, it will be our attempting to fortify these heights, as, on that event's taking place, we shall be able to command a great part of the town, and almost the whole harbor, and to make them rather disagreeable than otherwise. Within these three or four days, I've received sundry accounts from Boston of such movements there, such as taking the mortars from Bunker Hill, putting them with several pieces of heavy ordnance on board ship, with a quantity of bedding, the ships all taking in water, baking a large quantity of biscuit, etc., as to indicate an embarkation of the troops from thence. A Mr. Ides, who came out yesterday, says that the inhabitants of the town generally believe that they are about to remove either to New York or Virginia. It's becoming a tradition on this show for me to come on and record a quick mini-sode whenever the hosts are out of town or otherwise unable to record an episode on schedule. This week, Nikki and I are in Iceland, home of the Vikings. I've been boning up on my history by watching the first couple of seasons of Vikings on the History Channel, and it only makes sense to interrupt our Black History Month coverage to bring you the strange history of Vikings on the Charles River. Have you? I've been boning up on my so-called history by watching the first couple of seasons 
I've been boning up on my so-called history by watching the first couple of seasons of Vikings on the History Channel. And it only makes sense to interrupt our Black History Month coverage to bring you the strange history of Vikings on the Charles River. Have you ever walked down Com Ave from Mass Ave toward Kenmore Square and noticed the large statue of Leif Erikson in the promenade just before Charles Gate? It seems a little bit out of place among the other statues along the Com Ave promenade of people like Revolutionary War General John Glover, Phyllis Wheatley, or Abigail Adams. What is legendary Viking Leif Erikson doing alongside all these statues of people with local ties? Well, in the late 19th century, a lot of people believed that Leif Erikson also had local ties. The ancient Viking sagas tell of a settlement called Vinland, a place rich with timber and grapes that expeditions from Iceland and Greenland sailed to under Leif Erikson. In the 1870s, a chemist and Harvard professor named Eben Horsford became convinced that Vinland was not a myth. It was a real place that existed in North America. Horsford was rich, having made his fortune by inventing a double-acting baking powder that made better bread. He used his wealth to indulge his interest in the supposed Viking history of New England. Early European maps of North America from the late 1500s and very early 1600s show a great river in New England, marked on the maps as Norumbega. As he poured over the maps and sagas, Horsford became convinced that the Norumbega of legend was actually the mighty Charles River. His money and influence helped bring an earlier idea for a statue of Leif Erikson to fruition in 1887, and shortly thereafter he discovered the site of Leif Erikson's house at a point along the banks of the Charles in Cambridge called Jerry's Landing. He installed a stone tablet there marking the spot, which was conveniently just a few blocks from his home on Brattle Street. In 1890, he claimed to have discovered a large Norse city along the banks of the Charles in Newton and Weston, near where Comav crosses the river in Auburndale. He speculated that up to 10,000 Norsemen had called the area home, and he erected a large stone tower on the western side of the river at a spot where he said there had been a Viking fort. The city he imagined would have supported itself by exporting fish and valuable oak burls back to Iceland and Greenland. Oak burls, as an aside, remain valuable. In 2012, Boston police arrested a burl bandit who had been targeting trees in parks around Boston. Burls are prized by woodworkers and sculptors for their erratic grain and unique shapes. As Horsford became more and more obsessed with the Norse history of the Charles, he convinced himself that he had discovered a network of dams and canals that the Vikings had created. These structures were mostly natural features and some recent structures that he had misidentified. His earlier structures were almost all just natural outcroppings of rock that his enthusiasm convinced him to identify as the structures that he wished they were. In a few cases, he did in fact find and excavate colonial era stone foundations but he destroyed any colonial artifacts in trying to dig under them for evidence of imaginary Vikings. Eben Horsford died in 1893, but in 1960, archaeologists made a discovery that partially redeems him. They discovered a Viking settlement in Newfoundland that corresponds roughly to the time period described in the sagas as Leif Erikson's period of discovery. They found nine house sites and enough artifacts to definitively call it a Norse settlement. This is still the only known Viking settlement in North America. So Horsford was right to believe the sagas. He was just a few hundred miles off course. If you'd like to learn more about Vikings on the Charles River, check out this week's show notes at hubhistory.com slash 017. We'll have a sketch of Leif Erikson's house along the Charles based on Horsford's observations, and we'll include a copy of a 1597 map that locates the legendary Norumbega in New England. To show that not everyone in his era bought into his theories, we'll have an incredibly defensive letter that Horsford wrote to the president of the American Geographic Society in response to criticism. For fun, you can peruse a tourist guidebook to Norumbega and Vineland, or the archaeological treasures along the Charles River, which was written by an author who is clearly a credulous Horsford fan and released just a few months after his death in 1893. We'll also link to a 2012 article about the capture of Boston's Burl Bandit, because it's fun to say, Burl Bandit. While you're on the site, make sure to click on the subscribe link so you never miss an episode. If you want to get in touch with us, 
you can email podcast at hubhistory.com or go to the website hubhistory.com and click on contact us. We're at Hub History on Twitter and we're on Facebook at facebook.com slash hubhistory. That's all for now. We'll be back next week with our final Black History Month episode.